have this S Basics Pitch Knitting Podcast episode 11. If you're a new viewer, welcome, and if you're a returning viewer, welcome back. I am Celine coming to you from Hong Kong. I can be found on Ravelry, S O C H Y A O C H I A, and I'm basic.stitch.knitting on Instagram. So, first thing, I'd like to apologize if you can hear a very loud noise in the room today. It's because I have, I'm having my fan on. It's really hot recently, and I'm not sure if it has always been this hot or it's hotter this few days because I just can't stand it. Like, I want to do a podcast. I mean, I want to record the podcast, but if I'm doing it without the fan on or anything like AC on, I'll be dead at the end of the video. Like, you won't have, you won't see episode 12 of this podcast.、Um, It's really that hot. Ooh, speaking about noise, last episode you might notice that there is a little bit of phone vibration noise in the video, like it wouldn't stop, and you might be feeling, you might be thinking, oh, is that my phone? Or is my phone looking for your phone? No, it's my phone, sorry. I placed my phone on top of my laptop, and the laptop was next to the microphone. I didn't know why I did it, I just forgot about it, and I didn't know why my friend was texting me non stop because she usually don't do that. And I didn't notice it. I mean, it's a vibrating like five times. I didn't notice it. That's how much of a good friend I am. Or maybe I would just say I'm really focused when I'm talking to you. So, yeah, sorry for that as well. I hope it won't happen again this time. So, last episode at the beginning of the video, I asked a question, and that is Is your experience before and after Ravelry different when, in terms of crocheting or knitting? And if it's different, how different is it? So,、uh, I've got quite a lot of、uh, responses from it. There are things I want to say about. My experience with Ravelry, but actually, what people have said is exactly what I feel about my experience, so there isn't a need for me to repeat myself. So, Beck K said, I crochet and knit. Ravelry contributes almost nothing to my crochet. I think because, like you said, I just figure that stuff out for myself. That's the fun of it. Since knitting is more often garment making, I use Ravelry a lot more. I get patterns, advice, and can see how a finished garment looks on other people. True. And also, it, yeah, sure, like maybe per, I guess I, I actually saw a lot of crocheted garment as well, especially on Instagram, like a、uh, crocheted bikini top. Oh my god, I want one, I mean a pair, and、uh, crocheted skirts and crocheted dresses. They're so airy, so beautiful. But I don't know how to crochet. I mean, if one day I decided to learn how to crochet, those were the reasons. Like, I saw a very beautiful drops, lacy crocheted dress that you can probably wear to the beach. I don't go to the beach. I don't know even, I don't even go to the beach. Why do I want a like, bikini or beach dress? I don't know. And Caitlin from Wool Jewel Podcast said, I think Ravelry completely changed the way I knit. Before I found it, I was too scared to knit anything that wasn't shaped like a rectangle. Plus, being able to share and connect with other knitters made me want to knit more often, which led to learning more and improving overall. Simran Kodif, <laughs> I'm pretty sure I butchered the pronunciation. Simran Kodif. She said, Before I didn't really knit with patterns, the most I had knit was lace dishcloths. I, in terms of pattern, I would actually just make scraps of gutter stitch cloth and then cast off. But Ravelry got me motivated to try more and make more. It also connected me with a community I had no idea existed. I was referred to Ravelry by a random knitter on the public transit where I grew up, bless her. I was also introduced to the community through podcasts. So, both for Caitlin and Simarine, before knowing about Ravelry, all they knit were mainly rectangles, you know, like probably garter stitch, I don't know. And that's exactly what happened to me. But 
to be fair, I didn't knit a whole, you know, I didn't knit a lot before knowing about Ravelry, but, but all I knit was garter stitch scarves. That's it. I never thought, pe okay, I actually didn't know people can knit in the round. I didn't know anything about it. And I thought knitting in the round is like more advanced and it's probably, you know, like it comes later in the development of knitting history. But I also read that knitting in the round probably comes first and also you know when you're knitting in the round you're just knitting and purling when you're knitting on a flat piece of thing you're actually purling and knitting like knitting on both sides on the right side and on the wrong side and it's actually more complicated than knitting in the round and I replied to Simran that we should probably call all those people who spread words about Ravelry Rav Angels because it's just so important and so good if you're knitters and the crocheters. Celeste from Yarn to Table podcast said, um, I love your question about Ravelry. For me, it changed everything. I started knitting in as a kid in the late, 20, late 90s. And although I kept knitting into adulthood, I never had a knitting community at all. I'll also only used patterns about 25% of the time because there weren't that many I really loved. I really agree with that because when I saw like patterns in knitting yarn store they are usually really old like not 1950s old which is cool but like early 2000s. You know fashion they come around every few decades and the 2000s are not back yet. It still feel a bit ugh. You see what I mean? The 90s were all the rage. The 20s, when the 20s, like 2020, well, when the 2000s are coming back, I will feel really old. Let's just put that out. <laughs> and Celeste continued, when I joined Ravelry, I started using pattern way more because I had more access to more patterns. So I found things that I loved. Also, the search tools made it easier to find the right pattern to fit some stash yarn or whatever. The other thing was that I finally had a knitting community. I began watching podcasts and started recording my own. Now knitting is much more fulfilling and it's a bigger part of my life. And I agree 100% with everything that I read just now. The way I usually search for patterns is I look at the yarn that I have and go on to Ravelry and you know use the refining tool that like say for example I want worsted to iron weight yarn and I want them between this yardage because that's all I have and I want like uh, accessories or um, garments or whatever to just look for ideas like what I can knit from my stash and that's usually how I use the pattern uh, function. Do you usually do it like, like the reverse way like how I do it or do you usually just look at the pattern first and buy your yarn or look into your stash and see if there's anything suitable for it? Like which one do you do more? Do you look at your stash first or do you look at the pa pattern first? And that's the question for this episode. So now let's talk a little bit about my knitting progress. This episode, I don't really have any FO, but I will have two whips, and one of which you have actually seen before, and that is my uh, Linen Tulip Tank by Pearl Soho. That is a free pattern. And I have my Tulip, tulip Tank in this project back, and, uh, which is given by my friend on Instagram. Well, I don't really have much new things to say about this because I actually talk quite a little bit, quite a lot about linen and my experience with linen and things like that and also the pattern. So I'll just, you know, show you quickly how it's like. So it has definitely grown. I know like if you're knitting something else like a garment, you probably don't see this as a growth. But do you remember how small it is last time? What? What is happening here? Okay, so I think last time I knit like up till here, I guess. And that's a lot because think about what this is. It's like a really, really thin yarn. Um, like this thin. And um, 
it's I'm doing short row now that's why it looks so weird like here it's like you know crunch up like this scrunch up scrunchy I'm doing short rows here and the short rows are getting longer and longer and at the end supposedly there will just be one stitch uh, or like a few stitch before the turning point oh my god okay it's, it's not too far off I mean it's not not too far away I'm almost there I'm almost there I wanna get over <laughs> this already I mean to be fair it's a bit tedious but it's not intolerable I think it's fine it's mainly because it feels nice to knit with this yarn, to knit with linen, and uh, it's also quite breezy. So, so far, it's pretty good, and I can't wait to wear it, but I'm not in a hurry either because Hong Kong has a very, very long summer. <sighs> so sad. And, uh, yeah, oh, oh, and by the way, when I was knitting this with this yarn, this skein of yarn, um, oh, I actually have the whatever uh, uh the ball band with me which is not helpful because i don't think any one of you have ever heard of this it's called pecore come to life get to knit filu airy and it's a pecore and pecore is actually sheep in italian but it is linen 100 percent according to, to this ball band it has it's 50 gram with one 30 meter or 142 yards of linen yarn so yeah I talked to other knitters in Hong Kong like when I went to some knit night and they say it's probably you know uh, like a manufacturer uh, leftover yarn which is not bad yarn it's just like excessive yarn and then you know they probably produce yarns for some other companies and the leftover they just basically create another like brand which is not really a brand to you know to sell them retailing them so when i was knitting with it there was a knot halfway through and i now that when i think back i don't know what happened to me because i just kept kept knitting like i just kept knitting like as in you know there's a knot and they, it's like a joint of two strands of linen yarn and I just keep knitting and now I'm so worried I because I feel like if I wash them like say for example push it put it in the washing machine like this it might just come loose and the whole thing might just unravel oh god and this I mean I don't know what to do about this because what I should have done is I should cut out, like cut away the knot and then knit with another strand of yarn, like uh, the new strand of yarn with a long tail so that I can weave them in at the end. But what I, I didn't do that and I don't know whether I could do it now, like say for example to just unravel it a little bit and then um, tie like on a, I don't know. Can I do anything about it? I don't really want to unravel it right now because I don't know if I know how to weave the whole thing in. So anyway, that's that's my first web and that's a pearl soho free pattern called uh, linen tulip tank. Ooh, I was actually trying to uh, knit a sweater called Ondawa. I'm not sure if that's how you pronounce it because when I read it, it's just weird. It's a very famous sweater designed by the Michelle Wong, like the Michelle Wong. And um, I was having this like skein of yarn and it's a Hifa 3, which is also called Ambla. And I, I bought it specifically having the pattern like Ondawa, Ondawa sweater in mind because I want it to be in grey and it seems like a good yarn for it, it's like a good grey for it. And uh, I recently just cast on like a knit a swatch for the pattern and oh my god it's so, it's a torture for me. So I cast on 
um, a swatch and this is how it looks like. A very small swatch because I'm lazy and also I totally didn't enjoy knitting this swatch. I mean when I was knitting the swatch for my uh, tulip tank, I knit quite a big swatch like this one. It's kind of big because you know think about the number of stitches in there. It's because it, it tells that I really enjoy knitting with that yarn, right? But when I did this, I, I um, in the pattern of Ondawa, it actually provides the gauge, the gauge for different panels. And I don't want to knit the gauge for every single panel, so I just wanted to knit the gauge for the twisted ribbing, which is like the, I don't know where it is, but... Uh, I think this is the fabric that I knit with the suggested needle size and this is when I go I think at least half size lower slower slower smaller and apparently this one looks better and this one is really holy but when I showed this to my friend Valerie when she actually said uh, this actually still look a little bit too you know, the yarn still look a bit too thin, like the fabric is not dense enough, which I agree. But that's not the point now. The point is, the yarn is like the stickiest yarn I've ever seen in my life. You know, like Hifa, Embla, they are super, super sticky. I might go as far as to say it's stickier than um, Letlopi. I mean, Letlopi is very rustic. But to be fair, it doesn't feel the stickiest to me. I guess it's because it's just hard to keep the tension and you don't want to break it. And when I knit with Let Lopi, the stitches are just more, you know, bigger and like far apart from each other and stuff sticking together. This doesn't look as rustic, but it's extremely, extremely sticky. I don't know if you can see, there's just a lot of like micro hair sticking out from it. It's just... And I just pushed on and I just knit. And it doesn't help that this is a twisted ribbing because I'm fine with knitting through the back loop. But this is my first time doing purling through the back loop and let me tell you it's the worst. It's the worst thing in the world. But I kept doing it. But while I'm doing it, I kind of know I will not knit with that yarn. I mean, it's difficult enough to actually knit like purling through the back loop. And if you need to do it with such a sticky yarn, it just doesn't help. So. So I looked online and see if I can replace twisted ribbing with something else. Like, you know, read the pros and cons of twisted ribbing and see if I could just replace it without any consequence. And I accidentally, when you knit, you pass the stitches from your left needle to your right needle, right? As you knit, the stitches that have been worked will all be on your right needle. But when you're knitting backward, you're, you pass the stitches from your right needle to your left needle and because and when you look at it from the back you're actually doing purling so if you know how to knit backwards you don't need to purl and I was thinking if I know how to knit backward I might not need to purl through the back loop that was what I was thinking so I practice knitting backward with my tulip tank because it has a fair amount of curling to do so I try to learn how to do the backward knitting and it's just not working for me it's extremely awkward I know every new way of knitting will always feel awkward but it's so awkward for me I just don't think it's worth it right now so I don't know I will definitely put on Dawa away for a while until I have found the right yarn for it I don't want a yarn that is super sticky now I know about it. And also, this yarn will definitely go to a color work project. I will now not force it to be something that it is not. It's meant for color work, so I will use it on color work. I feel that it's, you know, now shouting, Hooray! You're now not trying to force me into somebody I'm not, mom. 
So yes, it'll work. And um, ooh, I'm actually thinking about uh, hosting a Cal. And I th talk about it before, like I like to host a Cal, but I don't know what we should knit together. And from your feedback in the Ravelry group, some of you said you will enjoy a kale that is not very specific. Like let's let's knit this pattern. You enjoy better like if it's like a more general kind of kale, which allows you to explore different patterns and different yarn. And I think that's a good idea. And because I have quite a lot of yarn, like Hefa, Embla, and Ask yarn. I mean. I have quite a lot of yarn for um, color work now. I'm thinking about hosting a color work kale where you can do stranded knitting or even uh, what's the name for the other type of color work where you just do like a patch of color. Whatever, I'll just put it down here when I you know, when I'm editing the video. So yeah, I don't know when the kale will start, but I'm just putting it out here right now so that you can think about your color work project and the yarn you want to knit them with. Uh, it will be, don't worry though, because it will be a long kale. I will allow quite a long time for it because I'm a slow knitter myself. So don't worry. My second whip of this episode is a hap and this is it. This is not a hap. This is not happable now. It hasn't happened yet. Sorry. <laughs> so um, so this is a test knit uh, project for blacker yarns and it's a hap called, let me look at the name, it's called Belvrade Hap. I will spell it down here. I'm not sure how you pronounce it because when I look online it's a place in Scotland when I Google it, it's like a. It says Belvrade is a small remote settlement in the Scottish Council area of Highland. I'd love to know why the hap is named Belvrade, and because it's a name of a place in the UK, there is a higher chance for me to mispronounce it because in the UK everything is not pronounced the way it was written. So it's either Belvrade or Belvride, or neither of them. I first heard about the word hap from the book of haps by Kate Davis and Jen Arnold Culliford. I've seen the patterns inside the book and I've seen the book in real life because it's in one of the yarn store that I went to. and. I've heard a lot of people saying that it's not a book with a lot of haps actually. The name is the book of haps, but there are actually a lot of things that are more like a shawl than haps. So what is a hap? What is the difference between a hap and a shawl? To me, a hap is probably like a, a subcategory of shawl, or sometimes you call it a wrap, in, you know, like a wrap or a shawl. And um, not every shawl is a hap. A hap does have a very specific look to it. So according to the blog by Jameson and Smith, which is a yarn company in Scotland, in Shetland, the reason why the definition given by Jameson and Smith will be authoritative is because a hap is actually a Shetland type of wrap. So according to the blog, it says, a hap is essentially a wrap which is used to keep you warm. Of course they come in many shapes and sizes, but traditional Shetland haps are square with a center panel, a patterned surround, usually feather and fan lace, and an edging. So that is hap. And now I'm knitting like the, the center panel and because this pattern uh, what's it called again? The Belvride or Belvrade pattern is a half hap. It's a triangle instead of a square. A lot of people, I think, if you are watching many other uh, podcasts as well, which I'm sure you do, quite a lot of podcasters have been knitting some form of haps a little bit earlier. So, um,. I'm totally late for the game, but here I am test knitting for blacker yarns. I'm really excited about this because 
there will be some new technique for me afterwards like after I finish the center panel which I don't know how long that will take because apparently this is still too small and um, yeah oh and the color I use I'm not using blacker yarns although I really want to it's because uh, they have kind of a short test knitting period and I really want to cause it on ASAP and if I buy yarn online from them, it will be quite a while after. I feel like the yarn will not come to me soon enough, so... And I really can't wait to cast on. Uh, so I used some yarn from my stash. And, but I really, 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 really want to try some of the Blacker Yarns yarn. I feel like they are kind of like premium. And uh, I heard lots of good things about them, especially the blacker swan yarn that I really want to try which is actually suggested in this pattern actually so I will just buy some of the yarn for you know future projects or future test knit projects so uh, what I use is this and this is how much I was in a hurry how much I really wanted to cast on the pattern because I didn't even wind this up into a cake I just knit it from the ball which is not very convenient when I'm trying to knit in the met metro, which is the MTR in Hong Kong. I just need to stop and try to pull out a bit of the yarn from time to time when I'm knitting in the MTR because there isn't enough space in my bag for it to roll over to get the yarn out. So that's how I really wanted to cast on ASAP. I didn't want to wait for another few minutes farm or the current farm where they raise the sheep and it's on 100% perendal lamb's wool and uh, for apply available in 12 fashion colors shrink resist treated which is extremely interesting because when you look at the yarn I'm not sure if you can see it clearly it looks pretty rustic it's like um, thin very thin and I think it's two ply yeah loosely twisted sometimes loosely twisted sometimes a little bit tighter um, but when you see look at the the rings here apparently they were more loosely twisted and they do feel very rustic you can see a little bit of like stray hairs I'm not I'm moving it all around so you can see a little bit of stray hairs there and it does feel rustic I have never touched any like Shetland wool. I've never touched Jameson and Smith. I've never touched, uh, I think it's called the Jamesons. But I would expect it, I would imagine them to be quite similar in texture. This is what I imagine Jamesons to be like, like the Shetland wool yarn to be like. But the ball band said it is specially treated to be string resistant. When something is string resistant, I would expect that it means it's super wash yarn. And from what I learned about super wash yarn is that uh, the yarn, the wool is exposed to some form of harsh chemicals which corrode the scales of the yarn. The scales of the yarn is what keeps them, you know, kind of to create a fix friction to keep them clinging together, holding each other. Um, that contributes to the stickiness of some really woolly wool. And those scales, when they're agitated, for example, when there's an extreme change of temperature or like, you know, rubbing, it felt. And that is what felting means. And when you're doing superwash, you corrode the scales with harsh chemicals and some do the second step as well that is to coat the yarn with something that is essentially plastic so usually super wash wool will feel smoother but this doesn't feel smooth at all it's definitely more on a rustic uh, side but when I was you know when I saw like a knot I cut it and I tried to fold them together like cut it and then put some water on it and rub them really hard and when I tuck on it, usually it will like hold on to each other, like right? The old strand of yarn and the new strand of yarn will hold tightly to each other. But this doesn't, it just go like this. 
so it probably doesn't felt and it's probably like super wash ish I'm really interested I probably will write them an email and ask how do how they do it because it's just mm, doesn't feel like super wash at all which I love I mean I love it when it's not super wash I mean I love soft wool but at the same time I like a very characteristic woolly wool feel to things because it feels very original and true to how it's supposed to look like and um, and I kind of want to do away from all those like harsh chemicals and stuff like that as well I know I can't do away from them 100% at least at this stage I'm not doing it but I in my heart I always prefer like a woolly wool but there is a place and time for super wash wool definitely so I'm using this yarn but I only have one skein but I will need to have a lot of uh, main color for this the hat will be a three color hat so um, I was thinking maybe mix them together this is Cascade 220 fingering and it is non super wash wool and I think they kind of look similar but of course when you look closely enough they are not similar I think this is called navy in the navy and this is called uh, the colorway is called Y Tomo Caves Blue and this is in the navy but I guess this is more like a midnight blue and this at, you know it's more like a midnight blue to a brighter navy I wouldn't call it like a true navy and I plan to, when I finish these two skein of yarn, to use my Ask Hifa 2 yarn. Um, I think this is called Bright Blue, but apparently it was what I was thinking I would do, but I didn't actually get out the yarn. And when I took them out, I just realized how different they are. I don't know what happened to me. This is more like a turquoise, I believe. So what I'll do is probably wait for my another skein of Cascade yarn, I think. I don't have another like a navy for ply yarn, so yeah. I don't think I can finish knitting before the deadline of the test knitting anyway, but I'll try my best. After this, I will use another two color, which is another two Cascade 220 yarn. Um, one is in this color and another is uh, uncolored version. I don't know the color way. Here I'll put them in my show notes or in my project page. But this is more like a, you know, golden yellow mustardy color and this is just undyed. Yeah. They look kind of good together, don't you think? These are my favorite color. I mean, I love a blue and a yellow together. Whether it's like a golden hue, like golden yellow, or like more of a mustardy yellow. They look equally good for me. And I don't know if this makes sense for me. I always call them like Van Gogh combo <laughs> in my mind. Because it reminded me of the, uh, the painting Starry Night. So it's just my favorite. If you have seen my uh, uh, previous episode, I knit with similar color for my uh, babble head because this is definitely my favorite co color combo. Even if I buy another skin of Cascade 220, I'm pretty sure the uh, the color will still be a little bit different because they will be of the different dye lots and they are definitely now they're not the same. So I'm totally knitting out of my stash and when I'm doing it, it's I feel like this project would be like a stash buster thingy for me and it will be like a stash buster fade project for me because there will be like some fading of different you know blues and navy so it's interesting it's not perfect i know perfectionist will hate this but i'm fine really i'm fine so after that i like to get into a very brief stash enhancement section i don't usually have like stash enhancement section i don't think Anyway, but when I do, I do. So recently I bought some hand dyed yarn and this is probably the first time I actually bought yarn off Etsy. I mean, I think I had a little bit of hand dyed yarn, but those are ones that are available in the mainstream yarn store, you see what I mean? I bought Misty Alpaca from Loops London and I have had some, you know, Lorna Laces from Dara Morris, I guess. 
So to me, it's like it's just very different from actually buying yarn from indie dyers, from Etsy stores. You know, you see what I mean. So this is the first time I bought yarn from indie dyer, from Etsy store, <laughs> and these are the yarn that I was talking about. I'm not sure the color will come out really well. I hope it does because the the light situation in my room is not the best right now because the I think the sun is going down a little bit. I hope it still works. So um, if it doesn't work, I will just take better pictures one day. I don't know. So the yarn dyer is called Tammy Wee Colors, and Tammy Wee is a chemist. And I think she actually dyed the yarn with her own dye granules. She used to sell the dye granules on her Etsy shop as well, but I just checked this morning and it's not there anymore. I'm not sure if it's sold out or she just decided not to sell them anymore. But um, from her Instagram account, I saw before that she made the dye granules herself and it's 100% metal free and toxic free which is super cool. So I'm going to show you some yarn first. Um, the first color, I mean like the two, I'm going to show this two skein of yarn together because surprisingly they look quite similar to me in real life because when I saw the, uh, the yarn online it's really lilac-y and this is probably like way, it's supposed to be way softer and way like washed out-ish in the picture but I really can't you know complain because you know yarn and everything else just looks so different under different light condition they still turn out very beautiful and um, so I don't know I might put them together or probably not they're too similar to be in the same project so yeah this one this one has like a it's more like lavender lilac -y color like more pinky as well with some mauve here and this is a sock yarn for ply, 75% wool and 25% nylon. Same for this one. This one is definitely more like peony pink, like brighter pink, and a bit of like a brown, mauvey brown here. More brown than mauvey. So, kind of similar. Like them. By the way, they smell nice. I mean, I'm not. Yeah, this smells nice. Why is it? I need to ask Tammy like whether she does soak it in any kind of like um, fragrant liquid afterwards because it smells nice. Or maybe the dye granule smells nice. Is that even possible? Because usually they smell pretty bad, right? Or maybe the wool itself just smells nice. I don't know. I love it. So and then. I bought this one as well, and this one as well is sock yarn for apply 75% wool and 25% uh, nylon, and uh, it has a bit of apple green and some hot pink, you know, some white and uh, sky blue and some purple. The purple probably comes very near to the pink and I think the purple is probably in between the pink and the blue. I haven't actually um, opened it up yet to see how it looks like uh, in a hank because I'm really bad at reskaining things and if I've opened it up it wouldn't be in this form. It will look very awkward and I, I want to show you when it's the prettiest. And to be honest, when I first saw it, I thought of Kay from the Bakery Bears podcast. I don't know why. Um, it just reminds me a lot of her. So yeah, this is definitely not my my go-to color. I think, especially when and I feel like when there is a bit of green in everything, I will say, oh, it's not my comfort zone <laughs> because I don't like green. But the exception would be forest green or like the really dark green. That would be an exception. But like bright apple green like this is not my favorite. But I saw it, I mean on the picture I saw it, but I decided to buy it anyway. There will be a project for it. So yeah, this is like the first time, not the first time, but one of the very few times where I bought yarn without thinking what I'm going to knit them into. But probably shawl I guess. And then the last two bit is crazy because they come with speckles. And this is the first time I had or actually saw glittery 
spackly yarn not spackly like you know like metally matte metallic yarn with my real eyes I actually touched them this is the first time ever and look at the um boom so this one uh, it looks more vibrant and actually more uh, intense the color than the the picture that I saw on her Etsy shop I, w I thought it was you know more like washed out again but it turned out to be more vibrant and more it's like a chestnutty brown and it has silver sparkling uh, bits in it it's 75% wool it doesn't work here I think it's 20% nylon and 5% uh, stellina like silver stellina it's silver I wish it's in a uh, golden but she doesn't have this colorway with golden stellina so yeah and the next one oh my god look at that look at that oh my god oh my god it's pure magical when I saw this I don't know why when you look at the first book cover like the cover of the first Harry Potter book it doesn't look exactly like the, this but for some reason it just reminds me of that book so much and I just had to have it it feels like you know um, the first book where there's a Harry and also you know it reminded me of uh, the Hogwarts Express as well Hogwarts Ex Express so yeah it has some you know like again some mauvey color very very little green here and this the most magical blue ever I don't know what kind of blue it is and some plummy purple color and magenta pink oh my god can you see my improvement in uh, describing color maybe it's not accurate but it sounds professional so magenta and this part is the surprise factor for me because I thought it's uh, orangey when I was looking at the picture I'm not like the biggest fan for orange but I thought it's orange anyway but turn out it's more like a corally orange or bright red coral red color yeah so yeah it it also comes with glitter and glitter means magic like first thing I know there are a lot of people like oh I buy anything with glitter if it has glitter on it I buy it I'm not that kind of person I mean I'm not crazy about glitter but you know because this reminds me of Harry Potter already and with the sparkly glittery effect it just looks so magical to me I definitely do not know what I'm going to do with this but OMG, I'm going to hoard them for a while. So one thing about this Tammy Wee um, colors wool is that they don't have a colorway, they don't have a name for it. So I'm sorry, it's not like I can tell you, you know, oh this is Harry Potter colorway and this is strawberry forever, <laughs> I don't know, I'm just making it up. So there is no colorway, like no name, there no number. So I guess, you know, Tammy Wee Colors, I mean Tammy, I think her name is Tammy, is probably just still experimenting different colorway and things are not exactly repeatable right now. That's just my guess. So yeah, if you go to, the, I will, I'll put the link in my show notes and if you see a colorway that you like, grab it. You might not see it anymore in the future. So yes, that is my yarn stash acquisition I actually bought something else uh, but I haven't received them yet so I will show them to you if I have received them I'm really happy with my purchases recently and I can't wait to show you so oh and everything I show you I bought them you know it's not uh, sponsored so I just realized the past 20 minutes or so I was probably not recording my voice with my microphone so the footage like the sound will all be from the camera which will be even more noisy because my fan is totally blowing at my camera but i decided i'm not going to re-record it because i really need the time for something else like watching gilmore girls so 
Basically, when I noticed it, I just had to stop everything and go to a quiet corner and sob. <laughs> but the sun is out again, so which is a good thing. And um, so I'm happy again. <laughs> oh, and I, I talked about Gilmore Girls, and I know what you're thinking. What? Gilmore Girls? You're so late. You're 2000 and late, Celine. Yes. I own up to it. Because I just really don't watch, you know, TV program, TV shows. I just don't watch them. I've heard a lot of people talk of, talking about Gilmore Girls before, and I think Knitmore Girls come from Gilmore Girls. And apparently Gilmore Girls is a TV show from 2000, the year of 2000 to 2007, if I'm not mistaken. So that was quite a long time ago. And I just recently watched it because I just found out that it's on Netflix. Perfect resolution. I think last year, uh, I, I, I basically have watched Gilmore Girls, like the new Gilmore Girls, a year of the life, I think, a year in the life. I liked it, but I didn't like it enough to, you know, go crazy about it because apparently if you haven't watched the original Gilmore Girls, you don't understand how it feels to be attached to it or feel like, oh my god, you guys are back because I've never watched like the old original Gilmore Girls. So for me, the new one is just a new thing. But if you have watched Gilmore Girls, you know, from season 1 to season 7, I believe, it must be like all the feeling coming back to you, see what I mean? Because today, this morning, I listened to So Yesterday by Hilary Duff and I was like, oh my god, all the feels just shower me, you know. I don't want to talk about it <laughs> because it feels so lame. Anyway, so um, I went back to watch Gilmore Girls, the original one, and I fell in love and I understand why a lot of knitters love it. First of all, there are a lot of cool knitting objects. When I look at them, I just feel like, is there anybody knitting it for them? I mean, I know there is somebody, like the production team knitting it or buying the knit garments for them, but because what they're knitting, what they're wearing sometimes are so hand-knit, so not commercial, I just feel like there must be a character in the show that is a knitter. Does that make sense to you? But I know it's definitely not Emily, like not Emily Gilmore. She doesn't knit, apparently. Lorelai doesn't knit. Maybe Rory in the future might suddenly, I don't know. Anyway, no spoiler. And I'm only in the first or second season, so lame. But yes, it's like a wonderful thing to, you know, fall in love with the new things that everybody has fallen in love for a long time, like 17 years ago. Oh my god, 17 years ago. So apart from the knit objects in the show, you know, it's actually a very nerdy show. I mean, uh, Lorelai and Rory, they both read a lot. Everybody kind of reads a lot. So, you know, and I feel like knitters are usually quite nerdy for my brother. Why? Hmm? No, pa. I think knitters are usually quite nerdy too because at least you are the people who are willing to sit down and focus on something for a long period of time. You know, a bit of nerdiness in it, which I think is a good thing. So, I understand why knitters will appreciate this show a lot. And also there is a lot of like love in the show, can you see? Everybody's so nice, everybody in the town is so nice to each other. Sure, people talk about each other and news spread really quickly, but they are not done in a mean way, you know. They're just curiosity and in the end it's like all nice and you know, just love. I'm not sure if this is going to change in the future, you know, there might be some like big villain in the future, but so far everybody's just nice. So yeah, I'm really enjoying it, like 17 years later, which I think is fine. So um, now I'm going to talk about something that I said I'm going to talk about in my last episode, and that is Hong Kong and the knitting culture in Hong Kong. I got some question down in the comments uh, asking me about how it's like to knit in Hong Kong. I did touch upon the topic a little bit earlier and said, well, there just isn't much to say about knitting in Hong Kong because I just can't see people doing it. 
but I decided to give it a deeper thought and it, it, at least talk about it from a culture, cultural or historical point of view, why it is how it is. And some of you also asked me to talk about Hong Kong in general, not necessarily the knitting bit, uh, because you learn about different cultures through watching podcasts from different countries. And that is true for me too. I learn about you know, a lot of Canadian knitters and American knitters and, you know, uh, the British knitters through watching your podcast. And sometimes it's not just about the knitting culture. It's also about, you know, say, for example, the food that you need, especially the festivals that you celebrate. Because apparently, before starting to watch podcast, I don't really know what Thanksgiving is. I mean, I've heard of it and I, I know in the States there is always that Thanksgiving sales and Black Friday sales, I still don't understand, you know, um, the differences or the, you know, similarities. But for me, I always, for some reason, thought Thanksgiving is a part of Easter holiday. Don't ask me why. I guess it's because from what I know, you guys probably eat turkey on both Easter and Thanksgiving. Correct me if I'm not correct. <laughs> correct me if I'm wrong. Um, Apparently, I just really don't watch, you know, TV drama. People thought I watch a lot of, say, for example, American TV show, but I just really don't because a lot of them, they just have too many seasons and it's really daunting for me. So I don't know much about cultures in especially that part of the world. In the UK, it's a little bit better because Hong Kong was a colony of uh, England before. So culturally, when it comes to the English world, it's we're closer to England than to the States. So yeah, which brings me to think, yeah, why haven't I talked about Hong Kong, you know, in this podcast, apart from saying how hot it is, because it's really, you know, very, very predominant theme in my mind right now that it's really hot. And I guess it's because I always assume that people aren't interested. Hong Kong is a very, very small place to me. I mean, it's a city. But I feel like it's it's Hong Kong, it's small. People probably, it's it's not cool, it's not like Paris, you know. <laughs> it's not like Tokyo. People probably just don't care. When I have this, when I started to have this podcast, I didn't think about at all, you know, didn't think about talking to you coming from a Hong Kong perspective. Although I cannot not come from a Hong Kong perspective, actually, because I am in Hong Kong and... But the thing is, like, my knitting world is mainly just me in my room and the internet, so yeah. But anyway, you asked about that, and I'm going to talk about it. Under one of the episodes, Net said, I used to live in Tianjin, China, for one year, and local Chinese people didn't really understand why I would crochet or knit things. They always told me I should just go and buy them online. The only fellow knitters I got to know were actually expats from all over the world, but China. So, um, I would say it's kind of true in Hong Kong as well. It's kind of like true plus not sure. So I'm going to put out a disclaimer out there. First of all, everything I say is just my opinion and my theories about things. I only speak from my own experience because to a lot of people in Hong Kong, knitting is quite a private activity that they do at home. So uh, I don't know what they're doing behind their closed doors. So I can only speak for myself. And also personally, I didn't have great experience with the yarn stores in Hong Kong. And um, we speak different knitting languages because I learned to knit through online from the English world, so I don't know the Chinese terminology. I think that kind of prohibits me from joining the local group, if there is any, because um, I just don't know the terms in Cantonese. But anyway, I just really don't know whether there's a local group that is, you know, not for expats. I mean, the knit nights that I go to, it's not marketed as knit nights for expats, you know. It's like, you know, come if you have time. You know, we're, we'll be at Starbucks at, you know, 7 p.m. in this building. Or, like, you know, come to the yarn store at 7 p.m. There isn't anything like, you know, English speaking only. No, nothing like that. But for some reason, people are just speaking English. That's, uh, yeah. So there will be a whole lot of generalization 
which may not be fair, but I do think that there is, you know, a common general attitude, values, or viewpoints in every generation at a specific place across a specific period of time because a lot of things like how we think about one things or values and stuff like that are shaped by society and the social you know, economic status and things like that. So yeah, there might be some truth in it, even though it's mainly my theories. My disclaimer is like five minutes long. So I like to talk from the Hong Kong perspective first, why knitting isn't as big as a thing like in the States or in UK. Um, like why when you go to a knit group in Hong Kong, most of the time they are expats. And I guess it's like first the most obvious reason is Hong Kong is hot. During the summer it's hot, in the winter it's okay. It's like you know not exactly the coldest. It can get really it can get really cold, but it's only a matter of a week or so. It's never long enough for people to you know knit and wear something that's really woolly. And the second very obvious reason is Hong Kong. I guess also in China we don't really have a history of knitting. We don't have a history and cultural background of knitting. I don't know in China though, because the northern part in China is really cold. I don't know if people do knit. I think people weaved more than they knit. That's my wild guess. But say for example in Norway, like Scandinavian country, there is a very strong background. Like say for example for Norwegian knitting or stranded knitting and fair isle knitting in Shetland, I think in Scotland and in Ireland, it's fisherman sweater, Aaron sweater, you know, with a lot of cables. But in Hong Kong, there just isn't that. So in Hong Kong, people still see knitting as a very old-fashioned hobby that is you know, done by older generation out of necessity. But I guess every girl in Hong Kong at some point of their life has knit a scarf for the boyfriend or for the best friend, like a scarf, at least. But that's it. Like, they don't go on to knit anything else. So yeah, that's a very general view of how knitting is like in Hong Kong. And from a social point of view, I must say, Hong Kong people don't really enjoy a wide array of hobbies because we study really hard and we work really hard because it's hard to survive in Hong Kong. Well, exception of course is when you come from a very very rich family but then even if you come from a rich family you're still expected to do really well at school and Hong Kong people don't really have a lot of time for themselves to develop their own hobby that is not used to score marks in school. Like a lot of people learn at least one type of uh, musical instruments because it adds a lot of marks to, you know, your academic results. And if you participate in concerts and competition, it's, it looks really cool on your CV. And a lot of time it's all arranged by parents. So kids in Hong Kong and also adults in Hong Kong don't really have a lot of time for them to develop their own hobbies that are not frowned upon because they are not productive, like productive. But I think people in Hong Kong, they really like to go traveling because um, although it's tiring, you know, to just go traveling for a few days, like three to four days, to them, it's still like a breathing space. We all want to run away from Hong Kong for like a short period of time from time to time. So yeah, and because people don't really have a lot of time for their hobbies, they usually go for instant gratification, like, you know, like activities that bring instant gratification, such as eating, gaming, and shopping. Out of so many hobbies, knitting is one that is not very efficient. And inefficient is like the greatest sin in Hong Kong. And it has a historical reason for that. Like, the work ethics in Hong Kong is shaped by its historical events. This is not my uh, opinion. That I'm, I did not invent this. But I read from an article before when I was studying, uh, I was taking a course on gender politics when I was in uni. The argument is actually Hong Kong has always been a means to some ends of other people. Like when Hong Kong was a colony of the British Empire, you know, British Empire definitely did not love Hong Kong. It's not like, oh, I love Hong Kong. It's like, 
they wanted Hong Kong, they took Hong Kong because Hong Kong was useful. It provided like a opening to China market. And Hong Kong was very useful because it has very deep harbor around it. And you know, there are like ships and cargoes coming in and out every single day. So Hong Kong people wasn't working for themselves. They were working for somebody else. And when they think about themselves, they are like tools. And the, the usefulness, I mean, the value, the worthiness of a tool is to be efficient, to be productive. And after, you know, returning Hong Kong to China, Hong Kong is still like a tool. Like, you know, people always talk about how Hong Kong contributed to the economy and the finance of China, especially back then when China wasn't as open as, like economically open as it is now. So it's always like a tool, you see what I mean? It's always like doing things for somebody else. And the way you can prove, prove your worthiness is to prove that you can do the job right. It's not about us, it's about the results. So that's the work ethics in Hong Kong. It's changing a little bit and I mean, it's still the predominant work ethic, like the predominant uh, mentality, but it's changing a little bit in my generation, but it's changing around the world anyway. So yeah, like that's why Hong Kong people don't really knit in general. But even if they do knit, Hong Kong people are not the type of people who go out and meet new friends all the time. They try not to do it unless they're forced to do it, like say for example when they're working. So, And it's only normal that there aren't a lot of meetups for knitting in Hong Kong by the local people. And talking about it from a broader perspective, like from the China perspective, because Niri Net or Niri Neti said it's the same in China when she was in Tianjin. I wouldn't say China and Hong Kong is exactly the same, but we share similar bits sometimes. And that is uh, the importance that we place, the emphasis that we place on practicality. The modern practicality, I think, mainly comes from the historical poverty that is still in the mind of a lot of people who are living. This is my theory. So there is a necessary progress or process from social poverty to spiritual pursuit. So social poverty and then it comes economical growth and then it becomes materialistic pursuit because there is more like materialistic abundance in there. And only after this there will be more like spiritual pursuit. And I think knitting is more like spiritual pursuit nowadays because it's actually a lifestyle. It's about, you know, living slowly making your own things. It might even be in a political statement against fast fashion, against exploitation of laborers. There is some sort of, you know, anti-capitalism and anti-consumerism in there. So it's definitely more of a spiritual uh, pursuit for knitting. Maybe back then, it's not. Back then, it's more about necessity. We knit because we need the warmth and uh, it's more expensive to buy that, to make things yourself. And when you think about China and even in Hong Kong, we only enjoy the fruits of economic development in the recent decades, which is relatively recent when compared to the world. On that linear development from social poverty to spiritual development, we're probably still like a bit closer to social poverty than to spiritual uh, pursuit. Social poverty is still a fact in a lot of us, like in our living memory. Not in mine, but like say for example in my parents' generation, it's still in their living memory. And probably most people have not reached the stage where they think knitting is cool enough for them. For most of the people, it's cheaper to buy, so why knit? And for the very rich, mainly the new rich, knitting and making is for the poor. So anyway, in general, knitting is still very much perceived as a, as an old-fashioned craft of the older generation out of necessity. And uh, that explains why it's not catching up yet. I um, mean, the trend or the hobbies, people are not knitting yet. And I wonder if it will ever actually start like uh, the trend to knit in Hong Kong or in China. But yeah, again, um, I was just theorizing things. Just let me know if it makes sense to you and you know, there might, there must be some blind spots and 
you know, I'm very limited. I only talk about these things from my own experience and also from what I learn about, you know, the world a little bit. Just let me know what you think about it. If you, you know, whether you agree with it, whether you disagree with it, and you can just comment down below. And if there is enough of them or there's any like interesting, you know, perspective points of view, we can discuss it in our um, next episode. So I think that's it for episode 11. I have really enjoyed talking to you and i uh, hope to see you again maybe two weeks later happy knitting bye